that beautiful music. Well, let me be yet another one to wish you all a happy Mother's Day. These are some strange days we're living in, are they not? Yeah, as Jim, Jim, Jim stole my joke, I was going to say it looks like I'm preaching to a bunch of uh, bank robbers. But I like bandits better. That, that's, that's good. It's good to see most of you, or it's good to see all of you, but most of all of you. That's what I meant to say. This morning is Mother's Day, and we're going to look again into Proverbs 31. And I didn't realize it until Friday that two of the last three Mother's Day messages that our pastor has given to us have been out of Proverbs 31. But he assures me that that's okay, that there's plenty to be said here in Proverbs 31. Um, I'm also very grateful, I just have to add, that the barbershops opened up on Friday. Because if you had seen me yesterday morning, my goodness, it was almost two months overdue for a haircut, and uh, I looked like a 1980s televangelist. So that was remedied yesterday afternoon. So anyway, in Psalm 127, Psalm 127, in verse 3, it says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. As a warrior takes pride in his weapon, the thing for which he is finely trained and tuned for, in the same regard, parents glory in their children, especially when they do well. And like all blessings, when those are perverted, it brings much chaos, confusion, pain, and sorrow. Proverbs 10 says, a wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish son is grief to his mother. And 17.25 says, a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. Just as mothers and fathers are blessed to have godly children, God, the children are blessed to have godly mothers and fathers. Today is the holiday in which we focus on those godly mothers in our lives. Uh, I realize this is so un unusual, the pattern we're doing this. I forgot to do the scripture reading. So I'm going to go ahead and pause, and we'll do our scripture reading, and I'll pray, and then we'll continue. So if you would turn with me to Proverbs 31, I'm going to read the poem that is verses 10 to 31. So Proverbs 31, beginning in verse 10. An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She, all, she rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hands to the poor, <clears throat> and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself, her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. When he sits among the elders of the land, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let the works, let her works praise her in the gates. This ends the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. I ask you to bow with me and let's ask the Lord again to bless this time. Holy Father, we're so grateful this morning for so many blessings in our lives. I want to thank you, Father, that we've been able to come together this morning, the first time in several weeks. 
what a joy it is to be gathered with your people, to look into your word, to worship you, and to fellowship. I thank you, Lord, for your church. I thank you for the, the family that we are together. I thank you, Father, for mothers, especially this day, and not just mothers, but all women. For, Father, you have blessed all women through the the opportunity, as was taught this morning, to uh, share in the redemptive plan. And, and I just pray, Father, that this morning would be um, a refreshment to us, that uh, your word would be spoken mightily, and that you would use it through your spirit to touch the hearts of those here and listening online. I ask you, Father, to guard my lips and to open the ears and the hearts of all who are here and listening. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, just a little brief history lesson on Mother's Day in case you're interested. Mother's Day uh, originated from a 16th century uh, holiday called Mothering Day, Mothering Sunday. It had no connection at all to mothers, in fact. Um, it was a holiday that was on the fourth uh, Sunday of Lent, and the idea was that you were to return to your mother church of your youth in the town in which you were most likely baptized in the, uh, to the cathedral. And out of that grew the tradition to visit your parents while there and to bring them gifts. Well, in 1908, a woman by the name of Anna Jarvis, uh, who was a member of an evangelical church in Philadelphia, uh, started a campaign to create a national American holiday called Mother's Day. And this was in order to honor her godly mother. And this, uh, this, this idea of a Mother's Day wasn't welcomed at first. In fact, as history records it, the, the, uh, at one occasion she was presenting this idea to some officials, and they literally laughed her out of the room. Uh, they said that if we establish a Mother's Day, that will eventually lead to a Mother-in-Law's Day. <laughs> I guess mother-in-laws have always been... Uh, the brunt of some jokes, and I thought this might be a great opportunity to inject a mother-in-law joke, but I've decided not to do that. I happen to have great love and admiration for my wife's mother-in-law, so. And I can say that, I can say that because my mother-in-law has a wonderful sense of humor. Miss Jarvis's idea eventually won over the, the hearts of the people, and in 1914, she established Mother's Day. I'm sorry, he established Mother's Day. So the second Sunday of every May, we want to honor mothers and mother-in-laws, okay? And, and we do this in many ways. There are more phone calls made on Mother's Day than any other day of the year. In fact, I read this week that there are more collect phone calls made on Father's Day, so I don't know what that means. There are over 152 million greeting cards sold during the Mother's Day holiday. Approximately a quarter of all flower sales for the year occur during Mother's Day. And in 2018, it was uh, estimated to be $23 billion spent on Mother's Day. Mother's Day is an opportunity to honor uh, those women in our lives, and not just our mothers, but, w but mother figures in our lives. Not all godly women are called to be mothers, and we can recognize those women today as well. Many women do not have children of their own, but they show the same mothering qualities to their Christian family, the same love and compassion and encouragement, patience and grace. You remember in Matthew 12 when uh, Jesus was teaching and, and the people came and uh, they, they said, your mother and your brother are outside, and they want to talk to you. And, and uh, he said, uh, you don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll just read it. He said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hands towards his disciples, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. Here, Jesus is in, emphasizing in part that the family of God does not rely upon genealogy, but rather faith. There have been many in my life, personally, who have shown to me tremendous encouragement, self-sacrifice, and love, much like a mother would to a child. 
I think specifically of two women in my life who are not my biological mothers. Uh, I call them my, the, the Pam Pams in my life. Uh, Pam Wright, who is, of course, Daryl Wright's wife. She went to be with the Lord in November of 2018. And Eddie Moffitt's wife, uh, Pam Moffitt. Both of these women are just two, and there are many in this congregation. But they, have, they are friends of mine, they are sisters of mine, and they are godly figures to me. They're godly mother figures to me. So just because you are not a biological mother, uh, remember that you have the opportunity within the family of God to have a sweet mothering influence on those around you. The impact of mothers is tremendous, is it not? Of course it is. They impact our lives unlike anyone else, really, in our lives. And that impact could be for better or for worse. A mother's influence lives on long after she is gone. And we hope for that impact to be a good one. But I know that it can also be a negative one. There are absent mothers, and there are cruel mothers, sadly, in this world. And that causes some to have profound sorrow and grief on this day. For others, there's a deep longing to be a mother. But for reasons outside of their control, they're not able. And for far too many, they've experienced the loss of a child. That weighs heavily on their hearts each and every day and can be especially difficult on a day like today. For these many reasons, I want to be sensitive with what I say this morning. My heart does go out to them. My heart aches for those who find it difficult to rejoice on Mother's Day. And my hope is that you know that God knows what's in your heart and that he does not dismiss it. I encourage you all to find refuge in his loving arms. He always knows what we need and he makes no mistakes. My prayer is that we will all find peace this Mother's Day in knowing that God's unique plan for every one of his children may not always look the same in this life, but it always ends the same. So like I said, a godly mother's influence lasts for generations. The Bible teaches that a life lived in faith towards God not only has the immediate effect of blessing those around them, through the love and sacrifice for, for a mother example, for example, a mother, that it's through the love and the, and the sacrifices that she expresses every single day for her family, through the compassion and the care that she pours out, and through the truth that she lives by and teaches her children. A godly mother is an immeasurable blessing to her family in the present. But the life of a mother faithful to God also has an enduring impact far into the future. That life serves as a witness of God's faithful power and uh, God's faithfulness and power while she lives, and it goes on testifying to us long after she's gone. Now, our goal this morning in looking at Proverbs 31 is twofold. We're going to look into God's word first to see God's description of what a godly wife and mother looks like in order to encourage these virtues in the lives of you women. And second, it's to instruct the unmarried men of what to look for in a wife, and the married men to, what to, to know what to support, inspire, and encourage in their wives. So again, Proverbs 31. Before we get into beginning in verse 10, I want us to set the context of this proverb by looking at verse 1. He says, The words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him, What, O my son, and what, O son of my womb, and what, O son of my vows? We see right away that this proverb is addressed not to young women, but to King Lemuel, a son. And, excuse me, that is to say that this is not necessarily a specific instruction to women, but rather, Proverbs 31 is instruction to men. And the point isn't that this is a, a detailed instruction manual for how to be a good wife and mother. It's not a checklist, but instead it's an instruction to sons of what kind of wife God wants you to have. And then, of course, how he's to respond to her. Now, 
obviously, if this is what God wants a son to find, this serves as a wonderful instruction for women as well. There's much a woman can learn about what God has declared as an excellent wife, and so I encourage all women to examine themselves by this text. But it's for you men and me as well, okay? So don't tune it out. This is actually in keeping with the entire book of Proverbs, right? Which is always addressed to my son. In short, Proverbs 31 is a picture of a godly wife and mother. It is instruction for men, young and old, on what to look for in a wife and what to encourage in your wife and how to respond to your wife. It serves as an example to you women to examine yourselves for the purpose of encouragement, not discouragement. That's something we, we reserve that right for Father's Day, right? We beat the fathers up on Father's Day, but on Mother's Day, we don't want to do that. No doubt you've heard that Proverbs express principles, not promises. Have you heard that before? I'm sure you have. The Proverbs are a literary style of wisdom that relate general principles to us. The way life usually works, there are, they, are, they are probable outcomes, not guarantees. We've all heard the expression or the proverb, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? That's a, it's not a biblical proverb, of course. It's a common proverb, and it simply means if you eat healthy, you'll be healthy. Obviously, that's not a, a guarantee. It's not always the case. In the same way, the proverbs of the Bible are God's general principles for life. They're meant to teach us the best way to live, the best way to honor him. They are the, the ways of the wise. So I again say the picture of the godly wife here isn't a checklist, an exact formula, but it's a principle. It shows us the character of a godly woman, a woman who loves God, who is faithful to her husband, and a blessing to her family. The descriptions of her activities in this proverb are couched in the ancient culture of the Hebrew life. So in case you read this description, women, especially verses 13 to 19, and you think to yourself, that's not me. I don't do these things. I don't gather wool and flax. I don't make clothes. I don't rise before the dawn to start cooking. I don't grow grapes or spin yarn. I sure am falling short of this picture. Remember that there are many ways in which these daily activities of living have become mostly obsolete today because it's the character of this woman that endures. That's what we want to focus on. Okay. So I think most of us today don't have to go out and gather wool and flax or make our own thread. You don't have to wake before dawn in order to prepare food for your family either. In fact, my wife likes to put it all in the crock pot first thing in the morning, and six hours, eight hours later, we've got dinner, you know, and she can go about her day doing other things. So furthermore, none of us are perfect, right? Obviously, we know that. None of us are perfect. This is an example that God wants you to look at. When you evaluate your role as women, the goal is to encourage you to become the best wife and mother that you can, not to beat you down and make you feel like a failure. Ultimately, we all have the example of Christ that we look at, don't we? He is the goal for our life, but none of us will achieve that perfection this side of glory. In the same way, women are not to see this as a checklist that they must meet every single point to, but rather as the goal. With that, let's begin looking at this, sort of a fly-by look at it. And first thing that we notice about this poem, verses 10 to 31, is that it serves as the conclusion to the whole book of Proverbs. You'll remember the first nine chapters speak about uh, uh, wisdom as a, a, a woman. Wisdom is personified as a woman. And here again, wisdom appears, but this time in the person of an excellent wife. John Kitchen writes, the ideals of wisdom presented throughout the book of Proverbs are now gathered up and presented in a beautiful, breathtaking, but practical presentation of wisdom embodied in, emo in motion, end quote. This is a fitting conclusion to a, to a book dedicated on wise living. For men, one of the most profound things you can do in life, one of the most wise things you can do in life is to find a wise woman. And of course, we know what is the beginning of wisdom. It's the fear of the Lord. We know that from Proverbs 1. What Proverbs 31 so wonderfully presents to us is a picture of a wife and mother who fears the Lord. We would call her today a faithful Christian woman. 
I've learned as I've been a Christian parent for some years now that I no longer, I, I no longer pray for my children to find a spouse who loves them the same way my wife and I love each other. Instead, I've learned it's far better to pray that they find a spouse who loves the Lord. Because if they love the Lord, they will truly be blessed in all the other ways. Now, you'll see in the outline I've, I've given to you that uh, I've, I've broken this down into seven sections. Verses 10 through 12 is the introduction to this godly wife and mother. And then we're going to speak about her industry, her generosity, her foresight, her modesty, her wisdom and her praise, and I suppose that last one could be split in half, and, and there could be a conclusion wrapped up in that. So, verse 10, let's begin. An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. In other words, she is a precious gift from God. The idea of who can find gives the idea that she is rare. Proverbs 18.22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor. From the Lord. Proverbs 19.14 says, Health and wealth, house and wealth are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife or a wise wife is from the Lord. Such a wife as this woman is a treasure. She is like precious gems. She is sought after and once found, she is to be valued above all else. A woman characterized by these things is a gift from God and a sign of favor to you men and to you children. This woman is made by God through salvation and sanctification, and she is entrusted to men, to husbands as a gift, and her value is immeasurable. Verse 11 says, the heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She truly is a helpmate to her husband. You remember in Genesis 2, of course, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And then he created woman. I find that verse to be one of the more comical verses in scripture. I, I think any parent who's had a son can can understand what God was thinking when he looked down at man and said, boy, you need help, right? That's exactly right. And so he gave us women, and what a gift they are. Warren Wiersbe points out that there's two key words in this verse, heart and trust, or love and faith. He says, when husbands and wives trust the Lord and each other, there will be happiness and blessing. And I find that to be very true. To have such a wife is to have an advantage in life. She can be trusted, and that trust is not misplaced. She does not disregard or misuse his trust, but uses it only for his good. He will have no lack of gain, he says. In verse 12, he says, She does him good and not evil. I'm sorry. Yeah, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Her life is characterized by faithfulness towards her husband. She does him good, that is to say, her focus is on the well-being of her husband and her family by extension. She is truly Christ-like in her selfless, sacrificial service towards her husband. So in summary, these first three verses give us this introduction. She is a precious gift from God. She is a true benefit to her husband, and she is faithful her entire life to him. Proverbs 12.4 puts it this way. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. I like that. These three characteristics of a godly wife and mother are now expanded on beginning in verse 13. We sort of see them in action. This is what it looks like. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She's like a merchant ship. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. For her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. This describes her industry, her work ethic, if you will. We don't want to focus too much on the very specific 
activities she's performing, but rather the characteristics that she exudes in them. She is a willing worker, and she finds joy in the work that she performs. Her efforts are not out of coercion, but rather out of consideration for her family. She is thoughtful, prudent, diligent. She is self-disciplined. She takes care of herself. We see that in verse 17. We see that in all of her efforts, her main focus is her family and her household. Now we understand, we recognize that circumstances arise, especially in days like today when unemployment is so high, where some women have to leave the home in order to uh, help support the family financially. This can be a real and necessary expression of sacrificial uh, love to her family when a young woman gives up her home life in order to help the family financially. That is, of course, the exception, however. We're not talking about the exception here. We're talking about the principle. The point is that God has created women for a role. And inasmuch as he has made that role available to women, to whomever you are, whatever role he's given you, through a husband or children or a home, you will find your greatest fulfillment in life by trusting in what he has created you for, not what the world tells you to be. This, of course, we know flies in the face of what the world will tell you. I find it difficult to raise young women today. They're constantly being sold the lie that husbands, children, and the traditional Christian roles for women are nothing but a shackle, oppressive, holding you back from your true potential, which is to do whatever. Don't be fooled by this. It is the oldest trick in Satan's book to say, did God really say that? Is that really what he wants for you? He's keeping you from what would truly make you happy, is what he says. Do what you want to do and be free from the oppression of God. That's a lie. God knows what he's doing and his design for women is perfect. It may not always look exactly the same in life, we recognize that, but we can, we can trust that the principles remain the same. Now, in this text, when we go through this and we look at her life, we, it's obvious that this, is, this woman's from a wealthy home. I mean, she has, uh, she, she's, she has the ability to acquire foods from afar. Uh, she has maidens in her home. Um, her clothing is fine clothing. And despite the opportunity to sit back and, and be served in life, this woman is dedicated to serving not only her family, but in verse 15, even her maidens. It says she gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She's a woman of service. Her dedication and hard work is a great blessing to all in her household. But not only them, he goes on in verse 20, to say she extends her hand to the poor and stretches out her hands to the needy. This needs very little explanation. Her generosity and her compassion extend beyond her family to those around her in need. She is an incredible blessing to those around her, both in the present and also in the future in verse 21. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. In other words, she has foresight because of her hard work and her preparations and her diligence, she, she has foresight for the future. Her family is prepared for the coming winter. Most agree that the mention of scarlet here in the text is not so much about the color, but rather the quality. Scarlet linens, scarlet clothing was hard to come by. It was expensive. In other words, she doesn't save the best for herself. She uses what God has entrusted to her as a benefit to those around her. Beginning in verse 22, he says, She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen gar garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength 
and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. She is a woman who presents herself appropriately, we could say, for all her hard work, all her service to her family, she still takes care to present herself well. She is, in a word, elegant. Such garments of fine linen and purple, again, suggest she's wealthy, right? Fine linens came from Egypt. Purple dyes came from Phoenicia. These were, these were expensive items. These were the finest clothes available to her, and I don't believe the point here is that she shopped at the Jerusalem Nordstrom's. Rather, that she, it suggests that she wears clothing appropriate to the situation of her life, to the, to the status of her life. It isn't that she's haughty or prideful, adorning herself to draw attention to herself. Remember, verse 30, she is a woman that fears the Lord. No, we see in verse 23 that her husband is known in the gates. When, when he sits among the elders of the land, he is an important and well-respected man. The effort that she makes on behalf of her household, she also makes for herself, and this speaks well of her husband. And in turn, it honors him. We know she's not a selfish woman. It's clear here. She's not a prideful woman. She's not some peacock preening around in wealth and luxury. She is a hardworking woman who takes care of her family, her household, and herself, all to the glory of her God. She is what you might call a biblical trophy wife, right? But not in the sense that that expression is used today. It's not about her looks. It's about her character. And the point is what is so very right on the inside shines forth on the outside. She is precious, faithful, industrious, thoughtful, self-disciplined, diligent, farsighted, compassionate, generous, and respectable. And the mark she leaves on everyone around her is that of honor. as well as on everything she produces, right? So much so that those outside her household are willing to pay for it, it says in verse 24. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Verse 25 says she presents herself with strength and dignity. She's not a mouse, but she's not a shame to her family either. She's bold and honorable, these words mean. She smiles at the future. She has nothing to fear. No doubt, in part because of her diligence and preparation, but also, and probably more importantly, because she trusts in the Lord. Her hope for the future is secure. So she smiles at the future. And this woman is wise, we see in verses 26 and 27. She opens her mouth in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. We see her wisdom in her speech, right? Proverbs 10.31 says, The mouth of the righteous flows with wisdom. You cannot be wise apart from the word of God. She is a woman saturated in the truth of God's word. When she opens her mouth, wisdom and truth come out. And she speaks this wisdom and truth in kindness. She isn't harsh or insensitive. She is kind. She is also wise in her self-discipline, verse 27 shows us. She recognizes the opportunity God has given her to honor him by spending her life and her efforts in the God-ordained role that he created her for. In other words, she's not lazy, right? Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And Colossians 3.23 says, uh, whatever you do, uh, how does it go? Whatever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord and not for men. I think I got that right. Is that close enough? <laughs> all in all, this woman is beautiful. She is a feminine reflection of Christ-likeness. That's what she is. She is wise, bold, and strong. Yet she is kind. She stands out from other women of the world, but not to glorify herself, 
but others. She has foresight and does not fear the future, for her hope is in the Lord. She is generous and self-disciplined, industrious and self-sacrificing. She provides for her family, and she does it willingly with joy. She is a proper helpmate to her husband, and she is faithful and a precious gift from the Lord. A woman like this is a blessing to all around her, but especially to her family, her husband surely and her children as well have found favor in the Lord because of her. And now we see the proper response to this woman, the instruction to us men and children. Verses 28 and 29. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, as he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel in them all. The simple idea is that of appreciation. Don't take your women for granted, is the point. Men and children, this is aimed at us, of course. Where this kind of woman receives blessings, praise, and encouragement in life is primarily from her husband and her children. At least that's the way it should be. We are to rise up and bless her, to praise her, and to be thankful for her. The biblical goal for a wife and a mother is to be a woman who strives to be like the Proverbs 31 woman. And the biblical response to her is for her husband and, and children to express appreciation and thankfulness, to not take her for granted. We all for, fall short of this, I know. As a, as a man and a husband and a son, I recognize my failures to live up to this standard. My wife, my mother, my uh, mother-in-law, my, both my grandmothers, all the mother figures in my life all come far closer to this standard than I do. I'm a well-mothered man, you could say. It's not that I don't appreciate them, but I often fail to express it as much as I should. So I want to encourage you men as much as this encourages me to uh, be thankful to the Lord first and foremost for the women in your lives, but don't stop there. Of course not. We need to be sure to express that praise to our wives as well and our mothers. It's not enough to simply recognize the value and the blessing of godly women in our lives. We must voice it, and we must do so in action. The principle of verses 28 and 29 is this. If a woman lives like this, then her children will bless her name throughout their lives, even long after she's gone. If they love the Lord, they will be thankful to God to have a mother such as this. They will recognize the gift that she is, and they will praise her all her days, or all their days. And not just her husband, but her husband, not just her children, but her husband too, it says. He says, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. In his eyes, there's no one better. There's no one better. She is unsurpassed. I bet if you ask the women who receive this sort of praise and recognition from their families, you'll find that there's no sweeter life, there's no sweeter reward in life than that, at least in this life. And these last two verses, verses 30 and 31, sort of serve as a summary. They they give a, a description of her spiritual condition. The Holy Spirit is letting us know the source of this woman's character and her virtue. Verse 30 says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Above all else, what makes an excellent wife is that she is a God-fearing woman. That is what makes an excellent wife. It is her spiritual life that fuels her strength and her beauty. I want the young women, to, my daughter and any other young women that might be listening, to really pay attention to this point. It isn't what the world tells you. It is what your God is telling you. It is that a God-fearing woman is truly blessed. Our culture today focuses on the surface things, charm and beauty. These are vain, empty things. 
They hold no real value. They're deceitful and fading. It's what's on the inside that truly matters. And that, of course, only comes through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, through trusting in him and the redemption and the, the new heart, the new life, the new creation that he wants to make you. In the end, this virtuous woman receives back for all her dedication, self-sacrifice, and love. Verse 31 says, Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. For a woman like this, her works speak for themselves. She doesn't have to go around lifting herself up. The whole world can see her worth. In conclusion, this woman's focus is on her house. She honors God by being hardworking, selfless, loving, and compassionate. She is devoted to her God-ordained role, and everyone around her is blessed because of her. And what lies at the heart of this woman's life is that she loves the Lord. She does it all to the glory of God. To be a godly wife and mother, in my estimation, has to be the most challenging of all jobs. But God says it's the most rewarding. Men, we're to, we're, we aren't to take our women for granted. C.S. Lewis wrote, the homemaker has the ultimate career. All other careers exist for one purpose only, and that is to support the ultimate career. I like that. As the God-ordained breadwinners, men, our careers are important, but only in that we provide the means in which a godly home is made. That's the point of our successes and our efforts. The men may be the head of a godly home, but the godly wife and mother is the heart. And children, you too are not to take her for granted. It's hard as a child to recognize that there are realities outside of your own. If you have a godly mother, it's hard to recognize that there are children who don't. You are truly blessed by God to have a mother who loves the Lord. It is the biblical response to be grateful to her, to learn from her, to be obedient from her, and to praise her. Let us all this day be thankful to God for mothers, and not just today, but every day. To be a godly wife and mother is the most important role a woman might have in her life. And even for those destined to not be a wife or mother, those same virtues and characteristics God has created for you to enjoy the blessing therein. Bow with me as we close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the testimony of your love, your care for us, your compassion, and your provision that we see in the mothers all around us. We praise you and thank you, Father, for your word this day. And I ask you, Lord, that, that we would hear what you have to say for us and that your spirit would touch the hearts of us all. I pray, Father, for our mothers this day, that they would receive the praise and the blessings that are due them. And I pray for them to be encouraged by your words this day. I thank you, Lord, again for the opportunity we have, and I ask you, Lord, as we go out into this world, that you would bless us with the opportunities to share the truth of your, the, the love that you've poured out on us through Jesus Christ. And we thank you most of all for the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ, that it's not of anything that we bring, it's not of anything that we can do, but salvation comes as a gift, a grace, a grace to us wrought solely by you. Thank you, Father, for that gift. Help us to live accordingly and help us to honor our, our mothers, our parents, and each other by living our lives according to your gospel. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.